the foreman went up to the guy and said, you know, you should be working, not playing chess. And he said, if you dare uh, make me go back to that position on the assembly line, I will tell everybody that you're a racist. And so there was a, a big problem, you know, where they had to inter the union had to get involved and everything. And part of the resolution was the foreman had to apologize. Mm -hmm to the black person. Now, mm -hmm. my friend, he saw this firsthand, mm -hmm. and he therefore resents it. And I said, well, you're perfectly fine to resent that one experience, but I wouldn't transfer that to an entire group of people, exactly. A, who you've never met, and some of whom you never will meet. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, yes, exactly. That is really the problem, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Should we go another half hour? Sure. Okay. All right. Let's go here. Yes, exactly. But that's, you know, we have a friend off the record. You're still recording. This is, or I can do we're it on, on the We're back on the record. So I have, we have a friend <clears throat> that we're not sure. So I, I got kicked off. They do text messaging. So he does text messaging with us. And I made some comment and he was just really rude and like told me to he, shut up. He was, he was rude because he didn't like your whatever you. Understood. Right. Like I made some comment because he was talking about my husband and I made some comment yeah. about kind of like the deeper implications of it and he's like shut up i don't want to hear it right and like so i was like you know what i'm not even going to answer any more texts like you don't want to hear my opinion or you don't want to hear what i think fine you know right it's also really hard with text message because you don't know whether he was be he's kind of a snarky character so yeah. i'm not sure whether he was just being like snarky right. joking snarky or whether he was just being a dick yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah. whatever it is right yeah so and even my husband was like this is so weird like what the hell was that and he kind of texted him back like what the hell was that right all about you know right. that was so weird um so he's been texting and we don't he, like we're kind of laugh about it just because i don't we don't both of us don't know whether he's being serious or being snarky about it but he keeps sending all of this kind of articles about like the jewish conspiracy you know and it's really like, I think the last one is from a, a kind of a right-wing website about how um, the Jews are trying to replace different peoples in different countries with Muslims because that way they can control them better. You know, and we like kind of joke about it, right? Yeah. It's like, okay, yes, the, the Jew, like who are these Jews? Who Who is this, you know, like... Oh, is it George Soros, the one Jew? Or is it like, it, you know, as you said before, you can't, it's silly to take one experience yeah. and then apply it across the board, right? Yeah. Because the, the variety of the way that people are, what they think, what they do, right? In a sense, that's the beauty of life. Like, so mm -hmm. you as an individual get your own interpretation of the damn thing, right? So... And Silly. are you are you successfully? Um, I mean, not successfully. Are you um, attempting to um, <laughs> communicate to your friend with the uh, conspiracy uh, frame of mind that uh, that there is room for doubt? You know, I I don't text him because I don't want. It's like it, texting him from my perspective now is like silly. I'm I'm actually <laughs> I'm so awful. I, I, if I see him in person, I will have a discussion with him to try to figure out what's going on. Yeah. I'm not going to do it over text. I think it's like really bizarre to do it over text because I'll never find out anything and it's just going to make it the situation like more silly, more mm. polarized, more, you know what I mean? He's just going to make some stupid snarky freaking comment and I'm going to get annoyed. It's like, it's not mm. going to do anything. Mm. So they occasionally come and visit so when they do i'll have a discussion with him about it also about the other comment like what the hell but <laughs> in the meantime i'm already thinking of, of like some crazy comedic skit with this whole thing of the guy with the jewish conspiracy so a way to kind of like what i really like to do as opposed to like address it head on is then make like some kind of skit where you can see mm -hmm. yourself in the thing but outside of yourself and be like oh my god <laughs> you know what i i just i actually think that it's more effective mm -hmm. i've um i've done it and i love comedy on top of it but i've also done it to people who have had i've had friends that i've had to deal with who have had like anxiety problems and other problems mm -hmm. and i s sometimes notice that if I figured out a certain thing that I could do while interacting with them, mm -hmm. it would actually relieve them of that anxiety 
but in a way that they wouldn't, it was almost like unconscious. Hmm. And I knew that they would probably go back to it because I always try to help people hmm. and I try to do it head on. But most of the time with stuff like that, it doesn't work, mm -hmm. you know? So I, for instance, I had a friend, Denise, who she had this weird, she was very like anxious around people and very nervous and, and she would do she would kind of have these very strange mannerisms in talking to you and you knew that she wasn't really telling you the truth. She was kind of acting, right? Mm -hmm. um, and she was not a little kid, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So one time I, I, I was talking to her and I don't know how I got the idea, but I started kind of mimicking her um, her movements, but not in a way to make fun of her, but just to like, mm -hmm. to mirror her, right? Mm -hmm. And she realized that I was doing it and just started laughing, right? Mm -hmm. As at seeing the absurdity of it, mm -hmm. you know, and it helped her to kind of, for, for that period of time, because I found it utterly annoying to have to deal with that all the time. Mm -hmm. And it actually created, it was a little bit of a selfish reason. It created a space for me to be able to really talk to her mm -hmm. without this thing interfering. And it created a space for her to be able to laugh at it for a minute. And I thought, you know, I'm not sure when she leaves here, whether she'll just go back to it because it's so habitual, mm. right? But I gave her some moment of relief and a little bit of awareness. And I think that's really, for me, that's powerful and effective. You know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it doesn't change the world. I don't know, right? But that's how I tend to deal with things in a very proactive way. Mm -hmm. So who knows? So have you had any experiences like that where, for instance, your friend who I would say is lovesick, right? Oh, you were saying he's two people. Interesting choice he's, of words. Well, he's, right, right. Well, but he is lovesick. Yeah. Is he not? Yeah. Right? Well, <clears throat> the nice thing about my, uh, yeah, so I have a, it's parallel to your thing. I discovered the following, that, and I, and I knew about this from a long time ago. I mean, have you read, much, have you read much of Herman Hesse? I've read Siddhartha. Oh, that's it. So you, you never read Steppenwolf and you never read... I uh, think I've read part of it, but I don't remember it. Yeah, then. Beneath the Wheel. And, okay. So um, one of Hesse's uh, favorite uh, thoughts that he would incorporate into his novels was that we all have multiple personalities. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, and I, I remember reading that at the time and thinking uh, that it was interesting that he thought that way. But... Lately, with my friend who is lovesick, your words, uh, I said, um, gee, you know, there's really two of you. There's the you mm. who states, I'm totally over her. I'm moving on with my life. Everything is going to be positive from here on in. And I'm going to keep getting better and better and better every day. And then there's the you B, we'll call it, you know, A and B. Mm. So A wants to move on, and but B is like, when I'm around her, I sense I'm in love with her humanity. It, got, it gets weird. He goes like, it's like a child around a mother or a brother around a wow. sister. Mm, that's deep. <laughs> it's not romantic in the least, I assure you. Mm. <laughs> that's deep though yeah. that's deep he's in deep yeah so that's the number one thing he's in deep okay but the fact that i'm able to separate the two personalities makes it easier for him because i'm not blaming him i'm blaming the bad part of him mm -hmm. and i'm encouraging the good part of him mm -hmm. and i and i thought this is going to work he's going to listen to me because now when i'm critical it's not all of him, but it's just that bad part that he also wants to suppress in himself, too. Right, but I think that, so I think it's really interesting. I've, I think it's really interesting. I think that, so I say love sick, right? Yeah. Because it makes me think of another word, which is dope sick, right? Because he's a bit of an addict at the moment, right? Yes. So, I, and I think this is true. I think people get addicted to emotion, right? Yeah. Um, and it's, I'm not saying it's a good or bad thing. It's just something that happens, yeah. right, to people. Yeah. So I also, it also makes me think of, so he, so he has this problem, right? So he has this addiction and he wants, he really is making a very concerted effort to get over it, but there's a physical aspect to it that pulls him back, right? Yeah. Because when you get addicted to emotions, I, I do believe that you're, um, 
physiology changes in some way, right? Also, yeah. when you're with people, it changes, yeah. right? So you get used to a certain thing, and then it's really hard. Habits are really hard, right? And habits become kind of like can be addictions, especially yeah. when it comes to relationships and love or obsession, right? In some way, feeling that this person fills some void in your life, right? Because obviously when he says that it's like a child around a mother, there's some void in his life that was not fulfilled that this person helps to fill, right? Yeah. And he can't let that go, right? It's hard for him to accept the fact that that's something that happened to him that was part of his life, right? And he doesn't necessarily have to accept it. He could find other ways to deal with it in a, in a healthy way, but he just hasn't, right? And so now he's dealing with this very head on, yeah. right? The other thing it makes me think of that I think is super interesting is like, I forgot where I read it or heard it, but it's almost like he's trying on a new skin, right? Because he's so not used to being able to let it go, right? So he's almost like he's trying it. It's like clothes, trying on new clothes, right? And it's like, you know, yeah, they fit great, you know, but then you go outside or those, that new pair of shoes. I always have this problem. You try the shoes on in the store, they're awesome. You walk around in the store, great. You go outside and you're like, why the hell did I buy these stupid freaking shoes? Because they're hurting they're my feet. On comfort, okay. Right? I can't walk in them, but they were fine in the store, right? Yeah. So I make this analogy. It's because he's trying this thing on that is also... It's, it's kind of alien to him, right? Mm -hmm. This other person who's saying, I'm going to deal with it in a positive way. I'm going to... And I also think it's really complicated because I don't think it's necessarily about suppressing it, right? Because I think if you suppress it, it comes back with a vengeance, mm -hmm. right? It's yeah. like the return of the repressed, yeah. right? So you don't want to suppress it. Mm -hmm. You want to understand what it is yeah. and you want to feed it somewhat, right? Feed it just enough. Like with your demons, you can't suppress your demons you have to give them some food mm -hmm. right as offerings as a kind of i do it as a ritualistic thing mm -hmm. to keep them satisfied and happy and at bay hmm. because the minute you try to get rid of them they will come and bite you mm. harder than anything that you can imagine mm -hmm. right and i think it's also really really interesting that you mentioned this thing about herman hess and the multiple personalities yeah because i also think that that is a part of um so I believe it's uh, Hindu religion where they have like um, Ganesha, right? Shiva. All those gods have like multiple faces. If you ever see depictions of them, they all have like multiple yeah. aspects, right? Yeah. And I think that I always found when I discovered um, Hindu religion, I believe I read the uh, Bhaga Gavita. Bhaga Vita. I and I yeah. thought that was super interesting way. Oh, you got to say Baha. Bahagavad Gita. Bahagavad Gita. You said it perfectly. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. That's, it's so hard to say. But I just found it really fascinating when I actually, I read it. I read the whole book because I felt like it was actually a religion that understood people mm. quite well. Mm. So, and I think that this multiple personality thing that in our culture has been considered a bad thing is actually, a, it, again, it's a very positive thing. Right, because it also allows you to um, make use of resources that you otherwise would not have known that you have. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. and I think that our lives in in our <laughs> present culture is about unlearning all the bad habits that we've been taught. Or, uh, and that's another way of what I said, where you you learn the ideas that govern you. Yeah. And then you can challenge them once you, once you know what they are. Right. And you can use them in measure, right? Because sometimes you need to behave a certain way. Like you can't say always it's bad to do X, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because that it's very, it's very um, circumstantial, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to be, right? Like his, his right. X. There's a thing called circumstantial uh, ethics, situational ethics. Exactly. You're familiar with that? I'm not familiar with it, but it it's, actually It's wrong sense. to smash a snor store window and take something, right? I'm standing outside of a, I'm waiting for a bus and the person next to me is having a heart attack and I look over in the store window and there's a defibrillator. Well, now you have to break that because of the situation. You smash the window, you get the defibrillator, you save his life. Yeah. Right. Situational ethics. Right. No, no, but it, it's... And it, it, it applies to what you're saying. But it applies, I think, to life, right? Like his, his ex saying that she has to have that distance to him. Yeah. Right? Because if she gets... 
any and, warmth and whatsoever, he's going to misinterpret it. Right. <laughs> so your look is very <laughs> pregnant with meaning. Well, it's just life. You know, I think that you know, life is life is utterly interesting because of like its complexity. I think that we all try to make it simple, simple, simple in order to deal with it. Yeah. But I think I'm sorry. I'm for the. It's just like how intricate you know it is, and it's like if you really start to kind of like read certain things and put things together and you, you know and you realize that there's always this like hole of the things that you don't know right yeah but at the same time the picture is kind of in it's just like i find it amazing and infinite you know i just i don't know maybe i just revel in images right and I, maybe i revel in the baroque <laughs> of existence because there's oh like it's really there can be general principles and rules that are very simple but at the end you you know, it's you who apply those and make the call on how to, right? Yeah. Where your theory and your practice meet. You know? Right? Yeah. And that's what your life is about in a way, right? And also testing those things, right? Because they're not always true. Like you, you come to certain conclusions and you realize, okay, now if you apply this, it doesn't really work out how you anticipated it, right? So, I mean, I guess it leads me to say that life is an experiment <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> to some extent. Does that extent. apply to your own life? Has your li own life been an experiment? I, I believe so. <laughs> I try uh -huh. as much as I can. You know, there are, of course, I fall into the, um, I fall into the habits that I have. So, for instance, I have a job. I have to work certain hours, right? Uh -huh. And that's very unexperimental. Mm -hmm. It's very laid out for me, right? I also have my my eating, you know, all those things that you can't really do anything with. But when I can, I think I do it. And sometimes I do it in my own mind, <laughs> you know, whether it's with dreams or sleep or even just thinking, kind of uh, thinking logically through something or thinking through a comedy skit saying, okay, let's turn this into now a comedic situation. This is like a dire situation. What happens if we play it like this, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and then just kind of looking at it and seeing, okay, so what does that do to it? And what kind of information can I get out of doing that? Mm -hmm. So, and what about yourself? So what do you, what do you think about? Do you agree? That Somebody life? said to me, uh, they were talking about uh, relationships and they said to me, why don't you sign up for a dating service? <laughs> and I said, well, <clears throat> When you're going through, this ties into exactly what you were saying. I said, there's different ways to go through life, all right? I mean, there's the planned, and then there's the unexpected, mm -hmm. okay? And each person has to make a decision. Am I going to follow the path of planning or the path of the unexpected? In other words, whatever happens, I'll find meaning in it. I said, I'd like to go down that path. So I, rather than planning and you know you fill out the form as to what things you like and everything <laughs> well, have you been on these sites no, i haven't but my friend the french girl <laughs> and, and then you were you know you you have to cope with the fact like are they saying things that they think i'm gonna like in their in their formula for themselves and she calls it the supermarket of love <laughs> <laughs> and uh and so i said uh that the unexpected makes uh, it, it's a more desirable path for me than the planned. And I said, as a matter of fact, I said, the way I approach the entire world is like this. We are born into a world without any pre-programming whatsoever. In mm -hmm. other words, we are not pre-programmed because of our gender. Mm -hmm. We are not pre-programmed because the supernatural has a plan for us. We are not pre-programmed by the calendar, you know, mm -hmm. your, your, your astrological sign. Mm -hmm. Nothing pre-programs us, mm -hmm. okay? However, the world is usually conservative that we're thrown into. Mm -hmm. So we are influenced by these conservative ideas. One of which is we are pre-programmed, mm -hmm. you see? Mm -hmm. And you probably have run into this in your life where you were told you're a woman, you're not supposed to do that, mm -hmm. you see? And then you either accepted or rejected that. Or uh, what sign are you? 
Were you born during? <laughs> <laughs> you don't seem like a Pisces. Is what I get. You don't. You don't behave like a Pisces. You know, <laughs> which I think is really funny because I think that's great. <laughs> you know? So we we run into all these people who've accepted the whole pre-programming thing, and we have got to cope with that. In addition to our own internal ideas that we are pre-programmed, you know, right, there's right, a right. person who comes over here who's transgender. Uh huh. There's this guy he can't handle it, you know. Uh huh. Is it coming over tonight? What do you mean it? You know, the he, she. Like, what is your problem? I mean, it's a man who now identifies as a woman. Why uh -huh. does that bother you? It's wrong. It's just wrong. Uh -huh. You know, like. Uh -huh. It makes you wonder, like, what buttons is this pushing in this guy? I don't want to know. <laughs> Honestly, I, I don't want to know. It's like, you know, you got to deal with it, dude. Like, go over there. Um, yeah, I think it's really, um, I think it's really funny. You know, so I was just going to say as a joke, so I guess you don't believe in reincarnation then. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but I, think it, I think it's a very interesting premise, okay? Um, because there's a lot, I mean, we're getting now into metaphysics, right? There's a yeah. lot of different ideas about the world, right? Yeah. About the number of souls there are. This is very old stuff. This yeah. is like nothing really new that we're, the ground that we're covering. And I think that there's, uh, you know, I know some of the ideas about it. I, I think we can do an entire show just about that, that, you know, there's, I think one of them is that there's a preset number of souls that exist yeah. and they kind of get recycled and stuff like that. Uh -huh. Um, I, I would be so interested in finding out other perspectives on this, right? Because that's, that's what I find really interesting. I think that the ideas that people come up with, right? So even within the space, because what I think fundamentally is, is at play here, right? Is this kind of like, um, I, I don't want to say that it's a very philosophical thing, but it's also a very real thing, right? And it's the idea of being and nothingness, right? Fundamentally, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So that's what it is, right? Mm -hmm. So the reason why the world is conservative and we have like all these preconceived notions is because we're like, you know, we're hedging our bets against the chaos, <laughs> right? And the randomness of existence, right? Mm -hmm. Because out there, out in space, it's just, right? Right. In other, uh, in other words, the... the uh, it's difficult for people to deal with randomness. Well, it's impossible. How do you deal with randomness? I'll give you an example. <laughs> I'll give you an example. Uh, I'm at an art opening, and I say to my friend Kathy, I say, uh, oh, you, it looks like you're getting ready to go. And she said, I am. I said, you want me to walk you to your car? And she says, no, 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 I'll be okay. I say, okay. And then I, I'm talking to other people. I look over. She's still there. She hasn't left. And I said, and I thought, oh, you know, apparently she got, you, usually when you're out the door is when people will start saying to you, oh, and we got to get together sometime. No, no, of course, you know, yes, that, exactly. No, 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 and yes. And then you wind up staying a lot longer. Okay, I saw her a couple days later. She was wearing one of those weightlifter belts. Mm -hmm. I said, what, did you try lifting something? She said, no, nah, I got rear-ended. I said, when? She said, when I was driving home from the art opening. And I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And, she, and here's what she says. I feel bad. I just feel, feel so bad that I didn't leave when I said I was going to leave. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> Are you saying that if you had left? Yeah, she says, yeah, if I had left when I said I was going to leave, this wouldn't have happened. So I'm partially... I said, you know, come on. Randomness is like... Right, but it's partly true, right? So can I tell you... So, yes, I agree with you. Randomness, right? But it's it's you have all this randomness right and for me the ironic thing is amidst all this randomness you know the the cocktail party joke right the two women who show up in the same dress right and i remember being a little kid and going to a party with my parents and two women showed up with the same dress right and they were like appalled right and me i thought oh how cool like they thought of the same thing at the same time right like i thought it was great um, but I had a situation where it was like, it was absurd. I'm, you have to say it's absurd, okay? If nothing else, okay? The randomness of the universe and this absurdity, okay? So I, my mom's friend in Brooklyn, when I used to live in Bushwick, he used to sometimes drive me home when I would go and visit her, right? So one day he's like driving me home and I say to him, hey, listen, you know, we like pull up at a stoplight. And I said, hey, we don't have to wait at this light. You could, there's a little park here. You can go around the park so you don't have to wait at the light, right? And he says, 
oh no 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 like you know what if i do that and i'm going into the intersection and a car slams into my car and we have an accident like i'm just gonna wait at this light right so that's fine it, you want to do it your way it's okay i don't care right just take me home right so it takes me home and i'm home about i don't know 15 20 minutes about the time it takes him to get back to the house and I get a phone call, right? And the phone call is, you will never believe what happened, right? <laughs> and I'm like, what happened? Stanley was driving into an intersection and a car slammed into his car, right? Wow. And I was like, okay, what are the odd, like, so I have to tell you that if you would have taken the thing around, you wouldn't have been there at that moment. And I just thought like, this is so absurd. Now, can you deal with can you deal with the randomness in the world? Um, you know, I think I have my moments. <laughs> there are times where I just, again, you know, um, I'm going to bring it back. I'm going to talk about Nietzsche, right? And Nietzsche yeah. and Greek culture, which I love. Ancient Greek culture, I studied it. I think it's really amazing. Okay, okay. I think their their ideas about the world, their ideas about your existence. So their ideas about existence is that your whole existence, the point of it is to live a beautiful life, mm -hmm. which I think is amazing, mm -hmm. actually, to think about it in a very deep way, right? Yeah. And so what I was going to bring into it is like the, the Dionysus and the Apollo mm -hmm. approach, right? So it's like the more kind of earthy, chaotic, going with the flow approach, or the more... Cerebral. Exactly. Yeah. Cerebral, rational. but also rational, very, very, yes, rational, more controlling, right? Planning. Yeah all that kind of stuff. It's like, you know, so as I get older, I tend to be more Apollonian mm. than I do Dionysian. Mm. And maybe that's just <laughs> because my body can't handle the, the Dionysian um, peaks that I've had anymore. Mm -hmm. So I have to go a little bit more in the conservative, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Because I also call it much more conservative, right? It's, it is in some way. The Apollonian is much more, it's very classical mm. kind of, you know, you you do things a certain way, and that's the way you do it, right? Yeah. So I think that age and your your physical state has something to do with that. I I did like a short documentary about Albert Memmi, who was a very prominent intellectual mm -hmm. in the in the sixties, fifties, and sixties in mm -hmm. uh, France. Mm -hmm. And I found it really amazing to cut together a piece about him. The man is ninety six years old. Mm -hmm. And he was asked by the Sephardic, American Sephardic Foundation, what is a Sephardic Jew? And he said, you know, I, I don't know what it is. You know, I spent my whole life trying to figure all these things out. And I've come to this point where I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, we are these people who came from this place. He was Tunisian. Actually, he was a Tunisian Jew. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were there. We were always bothered. Then there was these other people who came from Europe, the German Jews, who didn't know as much mm -hmm. about the Torah and all these things. But he said, you know, at the end, what you have to do is you just love each other. It doesn't matter. People are, you know, people call themselves Turks. They call themselves, they don't call themselves Sephardic Jews. Mm -hmm. They're either Turks, they're Tunisians, they're, right? And it's like, at the end, all you have to do is love each other. That's what you have, mm -hmm. right? And I just think it's really interesting to come full circle like that too because I do think that you know there's that saying youth is wasted on the young <laughs> right because you have so much energy you have lots of things going on with your physically too right that we don't we don't think about it in our culture and I think your physical state very much affects your decision making right how you perceive the world mm -hmm. so if you're grumpy the world sucks in general right you can do stuff to change that right but you have to make a conscious effort mm -hmm. and um and so i think it's really interesting i think the world is really amazing in the sense that we come into it to present something right we bring something new like each person brings something new into the world mm -hmm. with their birth mm -hmm. right something unexpected mm -hmm. that didn't really exist before mm -hmm. but then that thing has to end right to some extent because the person leaves you mean when they die yeah okay. and new people come with new ideas mm -hmm. Right? And that's how the world changes. So, so you don't take the Hegelian view that ideas somehow battle it out between themselves? I think there's an extent, there's an extent of that. But I also do think that 
eventually things, you know, there, there's a kind of natural process as well. Mm -hmm. So there is battle, right? We are humans. We, right? But, but also the very Heraclitan view of like you can never step into the same river twice, right? Mm -hmm. Because you...